party strife at Rome. Never in its history, it seems to me, had the empire of Rome been in such a miserable plight. From east to west, all the world had been vanquished by her armies and obeyed her will. At home there was profound peace and abundance of wealth, which mortal men esteemed the chiefest of blessings. Yet there were Roman citizens obstinately determined to destroy both themselves and their country. In spite of two senatorial decrees, not one man among all the conspirators was induced by the promise of reward to betray their plans, and not one deserted from Catiline's camp. A deadly moral contagion had infected all their minds, and this madness was not confined to those actually implicated in the plot. The whole of the lower orders, impatient for a new regime, looked with favor on Catiline's enterprise. In this, they only did what might have been expected of them. In every country, paupers envy respectable citizens and make heroes of unprincipled characters, hating the established order of things and hankering after innovation. Discontented with their own lot, they are bent on general upheaval. Turmoil and rebellion bring them carefree profit, since poverty has nothing to lose. The city populace were especially eager to fling themselves into a revolutionary adventure. There were several reasons for this. To begin with, those who had made themselves conspicuous anywhere by vice and shameless audacity, those who had wasted their substance by disgraceful excesses, and those whom scandalous or criminal conduct had exiled from their homes, all these had poured into Rome till it was like a sewer. Many, remembering Sulla's victory and seeing men who had served under him as common soldiers now risen to be senators, or so rich that they lived as luxuriously as kings, began to hope that they too, if they took up arms, might find victory a source of profit. Young men from the country, whose labor on the farms had barely kept them from starvation, had been attracted by the private and public doles available at Rome, and preferred an idle city life to such thankless toil. These, like all the rest, stood to gain by public calamities. It is no wonder, therefore, that these paupers, devoid of moral scruple and incited by ambitious hopes, should have held their country as cheap as they held themselves. Those also to whom Sulla's victory had brought disaster by the prescription of their parents, the confiscation of their property, and the curtailment of their civil rights, looked forward with no less sanguine expectations to what might result from the coming struggle. Moreover, all the factions opposed to the Senate would rather see the state embroiled than accept their own exclusion from political power. Such was the evil condition by which, after an interval of some years, Rome was once more afflicted. After the restoration of the power of the tribunes in the consulship of Pompey and Crassus, this very important office was obtained by certain men whose youth intensified their natural aggressiveness. These tribunes began to rouse the mob by inveighing against the Senate, and then inflamed popular passion still further by handing out bribes and promises, whereby they won renown and influence for themselves. They were strenuously opposed by most of the nobility, who posed as defenders of the Senate, but were really concerned to maintain their own privileged position. The whole truth, to put it in a word, is that although all disturbers of the peace in this period put forward specious pretexts claiming either to be protecting the rights of the people or to be strengthening the authority of the Senate, this was mere pretense. In reality, every one of them was fighting for his personal aggrandizement. Lacking all self-restraint, 
they stuck at nothing to gain their ends, and both sides made ruthless use of any successes they won. After Pompey was sent to take command in the wars against the pirates and Mithridates, the popular party lost ground and the oligarchy became more powerful. They secured a virtual monopoly of public offices, provincial commands, and all other privileges. Living in security and prosperous ease, they had nothing to fear for themselves, and by threats of prosecution, they could deter any opponents who were elected to office from rousing the people by violent agitation. But the moment an unsettled situation offered a hope of revolution, the old fighting spirit reanimated the hearts of the popular leaders. If the first engagement had ended in a victory for Catiline or even in a drawn battle, a terrible catastrophe would certainly have overtaken the state, and the victors would not have been allowed to enjoy their success for long. Worn out and enfeebled, they would soon have seen a stronger opponent wrest both power and freedom from their hands. Even as it was, a number of men who had no part in the plot set out to join Catiline at the start of the campaign. Among them was Fulvius, a senator's son, who was dragged back when already on his way and put to death by his father's command.